What's going on, everybody? <clears throat> I'm a little late. I know. Um, late is kind of a relative term. That This engine has been running um, and doing surprisingly well for about a month now. Um, it's terrifying. <laughs> Uh, and, and there's so much going on with it that I, I'm just, I'm overwhelmed uh, at some points. Some things are, are surprising and uh, terrifying and very, very much so enjoyable. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to try to get rid of the light background that is kind of hard to deal with. So uh, today I am prepping the engine for a pull again. I know uh, I'm doing that a lot. The, this will be the second time the engine has come back out. Um, I thought it was the third, but I think it's the, I, I've put this engine in this car three times already, and I'm about to pull it out and put it back in again. So a lot of stuff that I'm gonna try to do tonight uh, before I pass out for a little while. Um, tonight, this morning, it's about 4 a.m. and um, there are some things that I'm going to fix that, uh, are kind of important. The, the engine runs just fine. Well, it did until the crank position sensor went out. Um, but that has nothing to do with the swap. That is more of a, a wear item, um, and time and this engine sitting around for so long before it got put back into the car, what killed the sensor. So, um... Not really much I can do about that, except uh, order a new one, which I have. Um, it was supposed to arrive last night by 8 p.m., but sadly FedEx kind of dropped the ball on me there. Uh, I was a little disappointed, but uh, I'm, I'm constantly being shocked by Rock Auto. And I, this is not a sponsored video. Uh, I'm not big enough to be sponsored by anybody. So I don't want anybody to think that I'm being paid to say good things about Rock Auto or or negative things about FedEx. Typically FedEx has surprised me a lot lately and, and I'm quite happy to have uh, shippers, especially for uh, import people. I, I think we are more beholden to uh, transportation or, or mail transportation of all types than anybody else. Uh, and we like all of them. So uh, despite the fact that I'm sad that FedEx did not come through for me yesterday, it, it is what it is, and I will probably have the part Monday, maybe Tuesday at the latest. So um, it, it's kind of sad that the Rock Auto facility that the part is coming from is right down the street from where I work. And that kind of sucks, but it's kind of funny. Uh, the shipping information shows that it's going from Smyrna to Murfreesboro, and the Smyrna facility is literally right down the road from my uh, my workplace. So. But that's neither here nor there. Um, the car is coming out to have both the timing covers removed, uh, which means all the timing components have to be removed, and I get to redo the timing on this engine again. Uh, it was one of the things that when I was doing the research on this engine, um, I looked at it and was terrified. Um, and I'm still terrified. The timing on this engine is extreme and kind of interesting if you just look at it. But once you actually do it, it's really not that big of a deal. It's nothing scary, it's nothing terrible. It's just intimidating to look at. But beyond that, there's nothing really difficult about it. Uh, it simply just has two timing chains and they're both pretty well labeled. Uh, in the future, when I get done, when I order and have the block built, um, I've got to order forged pistons, rods, uh, and some sleeves for the engine and I will be considering things like closing the deck on the block. Um, I'm still considering those kind of things. They're further on down the line, but it really depends on where I want to go with the car. And right now what I'm building is a Corvette killer. So um, I'm almost done working out the preliminary issues with the engine, uh, which is why it's coming back out today. Um, there's a small oil leak behind the rear timing cover, which is why I have to pull the timing covers again. Um, and some issues of that nature that are, that are going to be cared for. Um, one of those would be the fuel line that I got. When, when I got this engine, the fuel line 
the uh, where the fuel line comes to the engine, the hard lines that are underneath the intake manifold, which I'll try to show you right here, um, are, let me get some light on that. Or try, there we go, there we go. So um, the fuel lines that come into the engine, and again, I'm trying, but you can see where that worm screw clamp is. Um, that is actually going to a hard line. And when I received the engine, the hard line had actually been crimped because that hard line actually comes up above where the intake manifold is at some point during shipment, uh, or rather I should say at some point during the wreck that killed the vehicle that this engine came from, um, during the extraction of the engine from the vehicle that it came from, or during the shipping process, um, that hard line had actually been pinched uh, or kinked. It had been bent down and the uh, line itself had been pinched shut. At the time, the best thing that I could do was to cut after the kink and then uh, flange what was left of that fuel line uh, and try to get a hose on it. I thought that I had successfully flanged that and even though the flange looked horrible, uh, a buddy of mine, David, had uh, come over and he had helped me out with that. And uh, <clears throat> that was a very interesting experience. It, it didn't look very good uh, and it didn't come out the way that I was hoping, but I thought that it had come out well enough that I could attach the fuel line to it and that it would actually maintain fuel pressure. Um, because of the slant of that tube, it did not come out the way that I was hoping. Um, and it unfortunately had hidden a fuel leak that I had had, which this is great news for me. Um, one, because the engine never caught fire. Uh, and I suppose that very much so is a possibility. Uh, the fuel line was leaking directly over one of the exhaust uh, pipes. Hmm, I, I don't really know. Um, I made it. <laughs> the the exhaust headers um, that I had come uh, that I had fabricated, and they typically ran very hot. So um, I was terrified when I found out. I, I could smell it. I knew there was a fuel leak, but I was thinking to myself that maybe it was just because I have the engine running so rich, and I have the engine running rich because it has not been to a professional tuner yet, and I am struggling to try to uh, make the engine run with the base map and with this crank position sensor going out finally and being as violent as it has been i'm pretty sure that when i get the new crank position sensor and install it the base map that i received from haltech is probably going to run the engine perfect and i'm going to be very happy with it but I didn't realize, I couldn't diagnose it as the crank position sensor because what the issue was, because what I was struggling with wasn't actually being reported to the ECU. And this isn't a fault of Haltech, and I don't want anybody to take that. Again, I'm not sponsored by anybody. I'm too small of a channel to be sponsored by anybody. Um, but what the issue was was not being reported to Haltech. Um, the crank position sensor has to receive a certain number of failures uh, or the computer must detect a certain number of failures through the crank position sensor before it actually reports the fault. And in some cases, it might the crank position sensor might not detect a single tooth, and then it will roll over to the next one. And it's quite possible, at least in my mind, again, I'm not a professional tuner, um, so I'm not entirely sure, but at least in my mind, it's possible for the crank position sensor to miss a single tooth uh, but catch the very next tooth and have it come around and not miss any teeth for a considerable moment. And thus the ECU will never report the issue. And if this happens, uh, I don't know, 20 times during a 20 minute ride, it's a good chance, or there's a good chance that the ECU may never report this issue and it might just blow it off. Um, but because of that, that could have been the crank position sensor does send a signal to the ECU telling the engine or telling the computer where the engine is in rotation. And if it misses a tooth, the computer, while it will eventually recover and figure out where it's actually at, 
the computer might not send the signal to the ignition coil to actually send a spark into the engine. And this could cause a lot of power loss issues, which I was feeling. Um, and it could cause a number of other issues as far as running to, um, way richer than I wanted it to run. Um, mostly because if it doesn't ignite in the cylinder, then all of that fuel and air mixture ends up washing out into the exhaust and it's just lost to the atmosphere. Um, it's the worst type of pollution that we can make as, uh, from automobiles and that's just dumping gasoline out. Um, but it, it's something that had to happen for the car as it is right now. Um, I knew I was running it rich and I know that that's a little bit more, uh, negative for the environment the impact is not very good but uh, I didn't want to blow the engine up <clears throat> and what I'm doing for, with the car it, there's going to be an impact to the environment it, it's not that I don't like the environment or that I don't care um, but there's there's no good way to put it there's just going to be an impact to the environment uh, from building this car and I'm aware of that um, it, it's you have a list of priorities. If you really care about the environment, you buy a very small fuel burner uh, and, or you buy something with really fantastic gas mileage. And I knew going into this project that one, boxer motors don't really have the best gas mileage. Um, they're not the best performing engines out there in the world at all by any means, uh, nor are they the most efficient engines in the world uh, out there. Um, they have specific advantages and disadvantages and I'm, I simply chose this engine and this vehicle configuration because it's what I wanted. I wanted an all-wheel drive platform, um, and I know people don't believe me, but I really opened myself up, and when I started looking for a new car uh, before I bought this one, I told myself that I would not care if it was American, if it was Japanese, European, I wouldn't care, but I wanted an all-wheel drive platform. And it just kept circling back, my decision-making process just kept circling back to Subaru. And as much as I wanted to be more, I wanted to be more open-minded when I approached vehicles, um, I looked at X cars. Um, I, I'm gonna be honest that the only American platform that even got close to meeting some of the other criteria that I wanted was the new Ford Taurus show. And that was outside of my price range. I wasn't willing to spend the money on that. Um, so I, that kind of got thrown out and there wasn't really any American cars that really felt, uh, felt like they were calling to me. So um, American cars kind of got discarded uh, despite the fact that I wanted to be open-minded and I wanted to be considerate of a possible American vehicle to, to work on. Um, I just couldn't do it. Uh, I, I couldn't find anything that I was going to be satisfied with. Um, so it, it came down to Japanese and European vehicles, uh, and that was either going to be an X car, a BMW, uh, or it was going to be an Audi. Um, and then it kind of boiled down to there was really only one year range of the BMW 330s. Um, that I was looking at, and that was a 2003. Um, it, then we kind of threw out BMWs, and it came down to just Audi and Subaru, and the cost and reliability factor that I found from Audi was just not what I wanted to be dealing with. Um, the Quattro all-wheel drive system is a fantastic beast, but the engines, and the fact that sometimes there's a lot of issues with the transmissions and Audis, and again, I was doing preliminary research to narrow down my, uh, my choices. At this point, I wasn't doing full-on research on every single platform that, ha that met the, my criteria. Um, so forgive me if I'm a little bit off in some of my assumptions, but when I was running through these preliminary estimations, again, like I said, it kept circling around to Subaru. Um, and I was a Mitsubishi guy. My first car and my passion car when I was growing up was a 3000 GT VR4. Um, and that ended up being my first car thank, uh, thanks to my grandmother and my uncles. Um, and they didn't even know it. I hadn't told them. And, and that was still the first car that I was presented and, and I loved it. Um, <clears throat> so I, I was a Mitsubishi person and there's a, a fun-loving um, rivalry between Mitsubishi and 
Subaru and uh, I just kept circling the drain back down to Subaru and I finally threw out Audi and I decided fine I'm gonna go get an Impreza um, I looked at a few legacies but nothing really called to me and then I happened to find this car <clears throat> I don't know what is wrong with my voice, but uh, when I found this Impreza, it just, uh, that was it. Uh, I found the ad on Craigslist, and the very day that I sold the Jeep that I uh, had at the time was the very day that I went and picked this up. And uh, it was January 1st of last year, and I called the guy uh, because I wasn't going to bother with texting. <laughs> I just wasn't. Um, it, it was January 1st. I knew people were going to be... Uh, we're out drinking the night before and I knew most people were off and I was like that I just I'm not waiting until the second I'm gonna call this guy and I'm gonna get this car today and I did uh, my friend Wade who's in Japan uh, took me to go and look at the car I took it out on a test drive I loved the car um, so much so that I didn't even and, and this will this is probably gonna look really bad on me, but I didn't even fully inspect the car because I just felt it calling to me. As I was driving the car, I just loved it. And that was that. I, I went on a very short test drive, um, barely three blocks, and was right back, and I shelled out the whole money uh, for the car. I didn't even negotiate on the price. I just was that much in love with the car. Um, it just went out, and that was that. <clears throat> um, what I was, you know, I shouldn't have been, but I was so terrified, you know, if I start working this guy on the price, I'm gonna, uh, you know, he's gonna shut the door on me and I won't get the car, especially on January 1st, you know, that part kind of bit me in the butt, but um, I wanted the car, I had to have the car, uh, and I ran into a few issues that were, um, some were caused by previous owners, some were, some was caused just by time, um, and, but, most of all, it, the car was just right for what I needed, and I was very happy with my purchase. And I knew that I was going to get into a project. I knew that I was. Um, after I had bought the car, two months later, I was like, all right, I'm going to get an STI uh, front clip, and that's going to be that. And I was looking at it. I found the, uh, I found the front clip that I wanted, um, and I was going to be fine with that. And then... One day on my way home from work, I happened to see a Subaru SUV and on the back of it, I saw a 3.6 R and I went, fuck STI, I'm getting that. I'm going to put that engine in this car. That's what I'm going to do. And I went home, I, I came here to Nathan's house and I walked in the door and I said, I know exactly what I'm going to do to that car. I'm not doing the STI kit. Uh, I am going to put a 3.6 liter engine in the car. And I started doing my research um, and I didn't put the 3.6 liter in the car. I put the 3 liter in the car. Um, because of my research, I did find that the, the 3.6 had the exact same dimensions as the 3, point, uh, as the three liter. Um, except that the bore size was bigger and the stroke length was the same. And the reason that that's important, the outside dimensions of the engine being the exact same, the bore being a different size and the stroke being the same size, meant that the sidewalls of the engine or of the cylinders were not as thick as the three liter. And I knew that I was going to be eventually pushing power, which is where I'm starting to take the vehicle now. And um, that just kind of led to this, okay, well, I'm gonna go with a three liter instead. It's, 3.6 uh, or 3.0, you know, it's really no big deal because the base isn't going to stay anyways. So uh, I'm coming full circle. We're working on the 3 liter. It's been installed. I mean, I've been driving the car for about a month now. Um, I did deba uh, debut the car at, uh, at MTAC, and um, that was really fun for me. I really enjoyed that. Um, but now it's time to do some work on it again. It's, uh, the engine has to come out. I've got to pull the front timing covers and reseal those. Uh, and that's going to be a lot of work. So um, tonight before I sleep, uh, it's going to be uh, prep the motor for a pull. And I'm going to uh, deal with some of the pre uh, preliminary issues like replacing the fuel hard lines and uh, wiring up the other radiator fan. Uh, and at the same time, I've got to consider 
Um, at the same time, I also have to consider blocking off the front of the radiator a little bit, uh, which is funny. That actually came from Billy, and I had already been thinking about it. My buddy Billy, who's not really a car guy, um, but he likes teasing me because my cars never run right. Well, you know what? F you, Billy. Um, but he's right. You know, the, the car is not running right. It's a crank sensor. I know what the fault is now. I've got one on the way and everything, but... Um, I always dabble in my cars. I always pay cash for my cars. I always buy used cars, and I'm not afraid of things that are or were broken uh, to work on. So I end up with cars that need service every now and then, and most of the time it's not things that I can be, um, I can take care of in advance. Um, this engine is going to, over the course of my ownership, receive a lot of new sensors and a lot of new things, but Replacing the crank sensor while it was eventually on the list of things that I was going to take care of, it's not high on the list. I know I'm going to turbo the car. So higher up on the list than putting a new crank sensor on is changing the MAF sensor, uh, the mass airflow sensor, to a MAP sensor and actually going ahead with something in the lines of uh, three bar, um, which I doubt I'm gonna put three bar of boost into the car. Um, three atmospheres, is, uh, one bar is an atmosphere, uh, which is about 14.5 PSI, um, but I doubt I'm gonna put three bar of boost into the car. That would be about 45 pounds of boost. I'm not gonna go that far, but um, the objective would be to get something that I'm not gonna have to replace later. Um, if I have to spend $200 on a map sensor that will cover the range that I really want to cover, then fantastic. I doubt that I'm actually going to even break two bar, but I don't know that. I'm very early on in this build. Again, I haven't even really started the build process of it other than replacing the fuel injectors. I do have aftermarket fuel injectors um, already on the vehicle and I've already fixed the program in the ECU to handle that. Um, but. I don't know where I'm going with this car. I've got an idea, I've got a goal and an objective, but I don't fully have it mapped out for how I'm gonna get there. So um, as I work on those things, before I buy the map sensor, of course I'm going to more closely finalize what it is that I'm gonna actually do with the engine um, because that's kind of important. But um, as I move forward, I'm gonna handle replacing things. And in, in, this, in this case, in this scenario, the crank sensor just went out before I could get to it. Um, all of the water temperature sensors are gonna come out. All of the cam sensors are gonna come out. Um, all of the sensors in this engine will be replaced, but it's all money. And while I'm working to basically pay for this project, um, things, I still have to pay rent. I still have a phone bill to pay, um, which I completely forgot about <laughs> this month, but it's been paid at this point. Um, but I, I have other bills and other responsibilities that I have to take care of. So I can't be super careless and I have to pick and choose my battles. Um, I could have ordered a crank sensor two weeks ago. I didn't think that was the issue. Again, I didn't have any information. I didn't have enough information to really diagnose that a crank sensor was actually going out. So instead of buying a crank sensor, I bought the new fuel rail. I bought a new, um, uh, AVLS uh, solenoid, I, and I'm, I get these mixed up. Um, there are two different variable valve timing solenoids on this car. One is an AVLS and one is an AVCS. Um, and I can't remember which one is uh, the actual one. I'm pretty sure that it is the AVLS solenoid that I replaced, the one on the front of the block. But uh, if you're an EZ30 gearhead and you see this and I said the wrong one, I'm sorry. Um, but uh, it was more important to me to replace the, the variable valve timing solenoid because the one that came with the engine had actually broken off the connector clip. So um, again, without the diagnostic information telling me that I had a bad crank sensor or a failing crank sensor, um, I instead bought other parts that I knew were bad that I knew needed to be replaced. One being that fuel line and the other being that uh, variable valve solenoid. So. Um, things are progressing and I'm taking care of things, but I I'm going to get slapped in the face. Something else that I know is going to happen is um, all three of 
the uh, accessories, the power steering pump, the alternator, and the uh, AC compressor. All three of those are gonna need to be replaced, and I know this is gonna need to happen. Um, and it, it's just one of those things that as I get to them, I will, but I might be slapped in the face one day, my alternator might stop working, you know? So it's on the list. There are things that need to be taken care of on it, but I have other priorities as well. Other things that are uh, going on in the world that I have to take care of. So um, I have a secret that I'm keeping from a lot of my friends and um, that is gonna kind of play into the uh, some of the delays going into the project. Uh, that I'm keeping from a lot of my friends. I'm keeping it from everybody. Um, there are three people right now that know about the secret going on and um, I am working to move things along. Uh, I hope that people will find out in July uh, and that includes you guys as well. But um, as it is right now, uh, there are a lot of things going on and so there are going to be some delays. Uh, and I'm really bad about sitting down and editing videos, so I'm not editing this I, at all. Um, this is being recorded on my phone and it's going straight up to YouTube right now because I haven't uploaded a video in a very, very long time. Uh, and part of that is because there is a lot going on. I'm very busy and I've been playing music this whole time. Oh, geez. Oh, well, I really hope that YouTube doesn't de detect uh, the music that's being played. Um, Granted, I probably won't earn any revenue from this video anyway, so screw it, whatever. Um, but that said, um, I will try to be forcing uploads this weekend as I'm working on the car. Um, it, it's going to be a quick project that I only have garage time uh, for yesterday, today, and tomorrow. Uh, so I've got to get this engine out. I've got to get the timing covers taken, up, uh, taken off, cleaned up, and then resealed back onto the engine by today. That has to be done by later today so that I can drive the car to work on Monday. Um, so uh, I might put that off a little bit. I might uh, call a coworker of mine and actually carpool into work on Monday uh, just to give it a little bit of extra time. But I still need to have that responsibility of getting it done today. Um, at least resealing the front and rear timing covers must be done today. So. I will get back to you guys, uh, and I again, I'm going to try to force some uploads today, so uh, you might see five or six uploads this, uh, this weekend, um, but I'm going to upload this video now. I will see you guys later. Thanks for checking out the channel. If this is your first time coming by, uh, please uh, subscribe, leave a comment. Um, I have promised some information, uh, a lot of information about um, the Easy 30 swap that I did in my Impreza um, that I am aware of that I have found, this is the first version 10 Impreza or generation 10 Impreza that has an EZ30 swap. The EZ motor has kind of uh, been discarded at this point and I understand that, nobody really cares. Um, it was a big deal in the early 2000s but um, nobody really cares about it anymore. I feel like a lot of people are kind of dropping out of the car scene as a whole. So um, I understand people probably don't really care that much but um, it's important to me. This is still a really fun hobby for me. And if it's a really fun hobby for you, stick around. I will get some of that information out. As, uh, as a matter of fact, I'm going to include a link to the post that I made on the uh, North America uh, Subaru Impreza's Owner Club website um, or forum. And that has all of the information that I have really put into this uh, project to this point. Um, I'll be updating it as I further go along in the project. Um, I need to update some information about the wiring for um, the uh, electric fans that are on the radiator uh, and some of that other stuff. So uh, moving forward, I'm going to continue to update my posts on the um, on that forum. And I will again this weekend, I will be pushing a lot of videos out or as many videos as I can out. So um, please like and subscribe, make a comment um, and make some suggestions. I mean, I'm in the beginning stages of a build project, I have a lot of research that I still have left to do. Um, I'm, I'm still undecided if I'm gonna go with a single big turbo or two twin turbos. I don't know yet. There is, there's magic space um, behind the engine on this car and it, it, it's creepy, but it's like Subaru knew 
It's like Subaru knew that people were going to be doing this swap on this car, or they might do this swap on the car, and they might need space for turbos. It's crazy, but the space is there. It exists. It's weird that there are two magic pockets behind the engine, beside the transmission, that are just perfect for putting large metal bodies back there. And it, I, I just... I can't rationalize it, I can't explain it, other than Subaru knew that people might want to put turbos back there. Um, anyways, uh, this video is long enough. I will see you guys later and uh, look, for, uh, look forward to more videos. I will talk to you guys soon. Bye.